make it better than yesterday. You can always find a way to start over again. When the sun rises, you can start over again. A new day, you can make it better than yesterday. All right. Hey, what's up, y'all? This is your girl, Diamond, and I have a special treat that I've been wanting. You know, this we we recently met. Like, was it like a year ago? It was, it'll be a year in January. It'll be a year. Yeah, it'll be a year. And we recently met at um, out of town, and she was at, uh, I was going out to dinner, and she was eating with somebody. And I was like, what? And we just kind of connected. <laughs> It's the first I fangirled a little bit. I ain't gonna lie. I fangirled a little bit. <laughs> of course. I fangirled okay. too because I love you and have been loving you forever. I want to, I, I've been wanting to interview this person because they, they represent a special part of my history. And yeah, I want to introduce y'all to Victoria Von Block. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hey, Victoria. Hey, Mama Sita. Uh, Victoria Von Block. Von Block. <laughs> Boon black. Mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> get a, black. Get a feel it. You get a feeling in here. <laughs> Maybe I was at Cre not Korean Change. I was at the Biometrics HIV Summit two years ago, I think it was, when I was in Vegas. And this white woman comes up to me. She's like, oh my God, I enjoyed your speech. It was so articulate. And she's like, you have such a unique name. Where'd you get it from? My friend was like, Victoria, don't do it. And I was like, it's too late. I was like, most likely from one of your ancestors. <laughs> he grouped and gobbled, darling. I, I I love to do that when people ask me, am I mixed? They ask me, are you mixed? What do you mix with? You just look- Black. Mm, I'm probably a little, no, I'm not mixed. Both of my parents is black, but it you probably see Slave Master in there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it wears them out. They, they, they can't take it. <laughs> they can't take the reality. <laughs> like, it's a little slave master it's a little um you know enslaved and oppression and it's just a mixture of all those kind of things and from both sides yeah right both yeah. sides, both, both, sides. Both, both of my parents come from plantations either my mother's goes back to a plant mississippi plantation where when you look at the roster it's just a name it's just a f and a and and a number of a kid, and then over here is um, North Carolina, also a plantation, and it, it was just a it was just a number and an M. So I knew my great grandfather was there, and my great grandmother was here, and then you know decades later, here I am, and yeah, that's why I yeah. Love I love, baby, I love those conversations because you know what people need to have these conversations. Someone asked her, she was like she was like, and what are you? What do you mean? Where are you from? Um. Long Island. <laughs> you know what I mean. You know, where are you from? No, bitch. Where do you mean? What is your nationality? American. Third generation suburban. <laughs> like, but she's like, you're like, well, what's your like, what's your race? Black? You know what I'm trying to say. No, I don't know what I'm what you're trying to say. Why don't you say what you mean to uh -huh. say? Period. <laughs> Let's have a conversation. Come on. So you hail from the beautiful, are we calling it beautiful, the beautiful Long Island, New York? You know, that is, that is a place. I am from oppressive ass Long Beach, Long Island, home of, you know, uh, racism, kind of like the Cracker Barrel, kind of where homophobia, transphobia, and racism kind of just come together. <laughs> and classism. And cla and class oh, we can't forget the classism, baby. Because ooh. oh, when I have went through some of the things growing up, you're one of the good ones. And all that I was like, how'd you live over here, girl? <gasps> yes, can't forget classism. So let's get started. I want to I want to know when you were growing up, who who was loving on you? Who was your community? Who were you living with? Like, you know, before you came into your truth, who was the people that was kind of rearing you? Tell me your story in growing up. Lucky for me, I grew up with three generations of women. I had my great grandmother, who's old school from Alabama, come to find out that she and my grandmother 
used to help Dr. King and like they would they were fixing the food for them when they were out there doing the things that they were supposed to be doing. Yes. Shout out to a little bit of history in that. Shout out to um Georgia Gilmore. She is the cook, like turned activist who actually fueled the Montgomery boycott with like herself in the museum. So your 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 mother probably was one of her people who was great grandma and grandma. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So um yeah, shout out to Georgia Gilmore. If you don't know who Georgia Gilmore is, make sure you look her up. But yes, go ahead. Yeah, so yeah, so we had three, we had three generations of women in my house and I was very lucky because for the most part, we were very loved on. We 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 didn't have so much. Um, my mother worked, my sperm donor worked, they were both nurses. And so I got to see them a couple of times a week, but we never felt like I was like missing out on anything because we just had so much, like my grandmother would cook. My great grandmother would cook and help us with uh, school work. And my grandmother, my great grandmother took care of kids. So we always had people around us our own age. Um, but yeah, and then I'm a I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cusp millennial Gen Z um, baby. So I had a little bit of both situations. So we grew up, and this is His Royal Highness Prince Poe Edgar the First. Um, we had a neighborhood also. So if I wasn't home, the next door neighbor uh, helped raise us. The lady on the other side of the house helped raise us. The neighborhood helped raise us. That is really common in Black culture that we kind of, um, this myth of this kind of um, patriarchal white is, I think really like a white supremacist, this patriarchal unit was a, what, what was something that was created for us to kind of, um, for white people to live up to. And that was never our journey. Our journey always had um, usually a mother and father, but also extra family, like a sub family within our family, like either it boarding people living in our house or next door neighbors, we always looked at our children in a way where we all were raising them. So when we think about, you know, people like to go back to the romanticized Africa and say, you know, it, the, the, um, it takes a village and that was the problem. Mm -hmm. We actually lived it here too as, as African-Americans mm -hmm. and because we didn't have um, some of the resources. And so we didn't have some of the luxuries and the privileges of other um, people so we had to help each other take care of our babies and raise and raise each other and our children and just be in a community way different in a way that other people did not have to and so this myth that it was this perfect only a man and a woman unit that wasn't the case back in the day absolutely not um I mean, I do kind of wish the I missed the ideology of the man back then because at least they took care of their kids for the most part. They took care okay, of both their families. Mm -hmm. And grandma and grandma, the, the grandma and great grandma ain't had sex shit because she knew that her lights was on mm -hmm. in the refrigerator because niggas is going to be niggas. Yeah, every generation. <laughs> I but feel like these now had to work. Hmm? Grandma and grandma, grandma and great grandma had to work too. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. And so like I tell people, well, and I started telling people like, cause they were like, oh, you're from Long Island. Yes. And I can, I mean, I came from an affluent part. Yes. But my family, how we got that house is my great grandmother was a live in help to these white people. And they bought her a house. And so that's how we got our family house. In mm. Long Island. It wasn't because we were just like, we did well. I'm not going to sit here like, I understand my privilege. We did very well. But it's not like we were just sitting at home, leave it to Beaver, mom didn't work. No, my mother was a full-time LPN. Right. My grandmother was a full-time, like, live-in cleaning person. And my great-grandmother took care of kids. We just happened to live in a nice-ass area. And I didn't have to walk for anything. Right. So... Who were the people that were affirming you or not? My great grandmother, surprisingly. And I say that because obviously she was a matriarch and she was the oldest. 
And so when I think about the stigma in our culture and in society was like, you know, people like, oh no, this, this gay shit, all this, this trans shit is on some new shit. No, it ain't new. Ain't nothing new underneath the sun. And my grandmother, when I came out, like most, I came out as bi. And then, you know, testing the waters, dipping the toe. Then came out as gay. And then came out as trans. And my great grandmother was like, when my mom had a moment, she was like, why are you gagging? We all knew about Victoria. That is still your baby. And I was just like, you would you would think if we were going by what society tells us or what TV tells us that she would be the hard pressed one and be like, uh uh-uh, uh, not in my house, not in Jesus. And then she points it out. She was like, the Bible says this part and this part. They were trans people in the Bible. And she was obviously she was like, oh, well, come on through, great grandma. Come on, Willie Ola. Honey, Matthew 19, 12, honey, said the, the, the Lord says, honey, if this is the life that, that can be accepted, accept it. <laughs> that, their version of what trans would be <laughs> in their context. That part, that part. And so that was that was the most affirming. But I also have to say, realistically, I didn't get into that until much later on in life. I didn't realize the things that were being said to me. I didn't realize the meaning of the things that are being said to me because I admit it upon this day on this land that for sometimes it was like I knew I was black but I didn't know I was like black because like example we lived I lived in from Long Beach and the next town over was Island Park and we had some people come in because I was a church Bible thumper seven days a week pretty much sang in a choir like all homosexuals (laughs) <laughs> like, <laughs> so, right so we 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 had we had a uh, choir practice at the choir director's house along in uh island park and we were waiting there for a car to pick us up and some white people drove by and was like you fucking niggers go home i was like why would they say that to y'all <laughs> to y'all <laughs> come on live long island pull it out <laughs> i was in my head it was so separate because i had never experienced stuff like that in my head i didn't mm-hmm. but then i realized later on how it showed up how people would be like oh yes this is your first you speak so well or you're not like the rest. Look at you being blah, blah, blah. I didn't put two and two together until I got to therapy and start to unpack that shit mm. and realize how problematic people were when they were calling me a boy, boy this, a boy that, white men, what they were actually saying. Yeah. So... Yeah, like, I I feel like I was very sheltered. So much so, I didn't know gay people could be Black. Mm. Because you never saw it. All the porno I saw was whites. Everything I saw on TV were whites. And then my girlfriend was like, girl, what about the guy from Designing Designing Women? I was like, I just thought he was an artist. (laughs) (laughs) like like, I was dumb cunt like I was sheltered they kept me in a box baby (laughs) and it wasn't a good old AOL that I like AOL in college Mm. when my brain started to expand all right so tell me about that what is your journey to embracing like your identity um in regards to coming into your full self it was interesting because AOL was a the AOL era was a time. <laughs> AOL and and Craigslist. Mm-hmm. Oh, those were the, oh, what a time. <laughs> Baby, that was a good time. So I started, I worked, I've been working since I've been 12. Let's start there. And I had a friend whose family owns nightclubs. 
in Long Island. And so this is back, you know, aging myself, I'm 41, but this is back when, you know, how did they find out about the club night? They hire us to walk around with flyers and put them underneath the doors, put them in the gates, put them in the mailboxes. Then if you went to a place, you know, there was a, there was a, a guest book, whatever like that, they get your number, stuff like that. And then we would call people like, hey, South Beach this weekend, do you want to be on a guest list? Blah, 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 blah. So before I realized that I was a ravenous homosexual, other people realized it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you call it? And so like at 12, I was doing that. 14, we started making the phone calls. Around 16, 17, I started actually working in the club. And so when they spooked me, they were like, we're going to put you on this night. We might, you think it might be more comfortable for you. And it was gay night. And so I'm working this and then some trans girls come in and a couple of drag queens and they're just like whispering and looking at me and they're like, girl, do you paint? And I'm like, I love acrylics and watercolor and I like really love art because I'm into fashion and blah, blah. And they're looking at me like, the fuck? Wait, what? <laughs> and I'm like, wait, you paint? No, girl, makeup. Oh, no, no, I don't do that shit. No, that's, I don't do that gay shit. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> mm -mm. Mm -mm. I don't do that. That was my night job. In the daytime, I used to work in a pharmacy. And so I would work in the pharmacy and they'd be like, ma'am this, ma'am that, ma'am this, ma'am that. And I was like, I'm a fucking man. What the fuck? Look at the name tag. So my whole life, apparently my mom told me this in a documentary that we shot many moons later, mm -hmm. that a nun told her I was trans at four. <laughs> Word. <laughs> but she didn't want to leave a plant alone. But she didn't want to listen because Southern Black woman wasn't ready for that kind of you know revelation. So that was the star. And I'm like, why is everyone confusing me for a girl. What is happening here? And then I went to college and I met- This is why, this is why the Republicans don't want us to go to school. <laughs> we get radicalized and turn gay. <laughs> you know, you learn a little something. Oh, and then you know, it was, it was, it was, I never, and I never looked back. Period. I met this drag queen named Blue, and she was just like, you are so cunt. And then she explained to me what the fuck that was. She was from Queens, but by way of Jamaica. And so she was like, let me get you dolled up one day. Mm -hmm. And so she put me in the Yagulas. Mm -hmm. And then there was only a few clubs in Long Island. It was Thunders in Suffolk County, Lux in Nassau by the college, and then South Beach slash Karma, where... I'm from in Long Beach, like Long Beach, Long Island. I mean, Island Park area. And so we went there and I met some other drag queens and I got up in a competition and I won second place. And I met this guy there. He perceived me as a girl. I perceived her as a man. We were just Confucius. And he Best, you know, best one date I ever had. Next day, sent me flowers and candy and everything. And then he was like, yo, I thought you were, I thought you were a girl. My bad. And I was like, wait, and he was like, yeah, I'm a lesbian. I'm like, oh, I thought you was a whole ass nigga. Okay, so we all out here, Confucius. Okay, okay, okay. You caught, so I'm like, ah. Huh. So I'm working in the pharmacy at this point. And I mean, I'm sure statutations of, of whatever is, is, is whatever anymore. And I started stealing the moans. And I started to get on that primarin. And cause you know, I'm listening to the girls and I'm on AOL and they're like, oh, blah, 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 blah. You should get this, try this, blah, blah, blah. And so I did. Mm. And so that was like the beginning of the end of my <laughs> of my butch nugget era yeah she was very short-lived 
let me go back to something you just said so I can give some also some cultural context. So, you know, there is a conflation that people do with drag queens and trans women. And um, I want to I want to share a little bit of history in regards One minute. I want to share a little bit of history in regards to that. Um, you know, usually when we come into our community, we are usually at an age where we're figuring things out. And we are at an age where um, where this whole idea of ourselves and identity and how we um, express our gender is new and we sometimes we we don't know the options we don't know um you know what we can do what we can't do and so we are learning in the process and figuring things out and sometimes in the process of that learning we do drag like participate in drag because this is where we could be free and put on girl clothes in previous times there was no place where we can be free like that and be in the safety of our community and safety of, um, you know, uh, the club where you can just kind of put on your girl clothes and be fabulous and be sickening and do just the dress up side of gender expression. And so drag for some of us, not all of us, drag for some of us was the first time that we were able to um, explore in public our gender expression and putting on girl clothes and doing that kind of stuff. And so it's not about gender identity per se. It's just about exploring being able to put on girl clothes because we never were able to do that in our younger years. And so now we're in the safety of this club. We're able to get on stage. We're able to be this kind of entity in these girl clothes Mm -hmm. and, and explore this art form while at the same time coming into our identity. So I want you to get, make sure that you get the separation when I'm when I'm talking about this because yes, there is some overlap in our culture when it comes to drag as an artistry and drag as gender gender expression, and then people who do drag. Sometimes it is trans women who do drag. Sometimes it is gay men who do drag because this gender expression, this artistry, we all can enjoy it. So yes. There are some trans women who are drag queens and there are some trans women who are not drag queens. And there are some gay men who are drag queens and there are some gay men who are not drag queens. It's just about the artistry of drag. And sometimes, in a lot of times in our youth, this is where trans women were able to be free to get on stage and get the attention from the people and actually explore dressing in these clothes and and getting a style and having a vision. And yes, it started there, but then it went into our real regular, regular life. Correct. Um, you know, it's it's one of those first times where it's like, <clears throat> yes, here we get a little deeper. I'm gonna get my shovel. <laughs> one of the very first people who actually affirmed me was the person who sexually assaulted me. Mm-hmm. Because before then, no one had really been like, I see you. And that man, you know, and I, 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 you know, it takes, it took years of actually thinking and processing things like, you know, hurt people hurt people. And that man had most likely has gone through some things in his life. And that's why he is the way he is. And I told that to my mom, like, it's interesting, when I came out as bi slash gay, she had an issue. She went to church for 12 hours and tried to pray it out. And my sperm donor was like, girl, we all, re- we all knew. Like, come on, it ain't no big thing. When I came out as trans, she was supportive. And the sperm donor wasn't. And I think to me, I'm just like, so it's basically what, the loss of masculinity that's the issue for you? Like... It's all good as long as you topping and you a man. But as soon as I come into my own and realize that maybe them lines are a little more blurred, that now there's an issue. 
Yeah, it's how people navigate it is so different. You know, my dad is somebody who is bisexual, who is gay, like who is um who is know the know what being queer is and he doesn't accept my transness. So it's weird. You it's it's the way I had a client when I lived in Columbus, Georgia. Love the girls down. All about the girls. And we were just talking. And he was like, if my son was to ever come out as gay or to like the girls, I'd beat the blood out of them. And I'm like, here you are with a whole dick in your mouth. <laughs> but if your child expressed anything other than heteronormativity, you trying to kill him? Make it make sense. They can't. It's hypocritical. But I also think it's about um, people having ownership of their children and their children being a um, social reflection of themselves. And so mm -hmm. it, it makes them look bad if you're gay. It makes them look like a failed parent. And their ego doesn't allow them to um, take away that possession and allow them to be free. And so... Yeah, I think it's a I think it's a layered thing, but I think one of the things is that that's one of the reasons they want you to be what they dream you to be. Well, is I mean, for the most part, I feel like that is what a lot of people think children are. They're just an extension of them or a replacement for their failed dreams. Mm -hmm. So because I couldn't make it now, you're going to make it. Right. And I was actually hanging out with the person who worked at the clubs, who owned his family owned the clubs. He had a Japanese girlfriend. And I'm like, of course you did. But like, she told us, she was like, yeah, in Japan, like, now this is back in 2001, 2002, tease. And she was like, yeah, it's known that people have kids so that they know they're taken care of when they get older. That's it. Those children are basically just an insurance policy to make sure someone takes care of you when you get older. And I'm like, that's why we have so many miserable people now. Yeah. Like, that's, thank the goddess. I don't think that happened for me, but I acknowledge that since I've been working since I've been 12, basically straight, I didn't have much of a childhood. And I mean, granted, it's probably a little bit because A, I didn't want it, but also B, because it wasn't really allowed per se, because I was always the fruity one. So the only time that the boys wanted to play with me is when they wanted to play house. <laughs> hey man, the boys who got wives and shit now. <laughs> and I look at them like mm -hmm. I'm still on your breath nigga <laughs> period tell your girlfriend <laughs> but you know and, and, and so I I think about that and that's why I feel like as a brat I'm now kind of feel like I'm like living out like in my 40s, when I started in my 30s, like now is my childhood. Now I'm actually able to enjoy the little things. Enjoy going to Disney. I went to Disney a couple of times as a kid, but I can't remember those days. Oh, that was overshadowed by trauma. But now I can enjoy the little things. Like, as you know, playing the video games, being on the video games all night sometimes. Like all the things that people equate to children or childhood like I still draw sometimes me and my mom get on the phone and we're coloring I love that so like you know I I I'm I'm very grateful for her she has been like my biggest supporter even as a child like when people got put out because their family was really like problematic they came and lived with us she took in all the kids. And so she has been one of my biggest supporters. We had a moment when I lived in Atlanta, but I realized that was her mental health. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, she's fighting with, I think it's dementia. How did she? 
She is, excuse me, now I got to think. She is 70 something. Oh. 70 something. I think she was born at 50 or 51, something like that. And so, you know, as I said, she was one of my biggest supporters. And then one day she just got phobic. Mm. And I was like, whoa, whoa, what's happening here? This don't feel right. Right. And that's when I came back up to New York. Cause I was like, I'm not about to, you know, bad enough paying $3,000 living in the fucking heart of Atlanta for what? Amen. The reason I came down there is to be with you. Yeah. So. Yeah. When I met you, mm -hmm. when I saw you, we didn't meet yet, but when right. I saw you, I was introduced to you in your online presence, you were a sex worker. Yes, God. I have been a sex worker for 20 plus years. Yes. And I too was a sex worker. And I paid attention to the girls because we would be um, advertising in the same places. And, you know, we was, I would see who was in the city and, and be like, oh, she looks pretty. Good. Oh, she got some new pictures. And you know, it would just would be we we knew each other's pictures and and look because we were in the same circles. And so, tell me, how did that career start? How did that work start for you? Um, I met Isabella Del Rio. Mm. We clicked because we were both from Long Island, mm -hmm. and at that time, we were both you know butch queens up in gags, weekend warriors. <laughs> and I would I would leave college like my last class I think was like let's say two o'clock or something like that just for all you know just conversation then I'd go to Nordstrom I get my makeup done buy an outfit and then I get on the L I double R and head to Queens to her house and we do photo shoots See, that bitch was she is still known for her photo shoots. Yeah. So we I was met introduced to Isabella on Night Flirt. And you know that it brings it back now. It's about to get about to age us, bitch. <laughs> age us. The very first trans women on Night Flirt, the very first trans woman that I know of on YouTube. Because I know you stuck with it and, and kudos to you for sticking to it. Cause bitch, I got over it after a while. I didn't have so many identity fucking changes from Denise Diamonds to Sasha, Fo the original Sasha Fox. <laughs> or that white woman took my name. And, <laughs> it. and then now still Siren DeVille. Mm -hmm. And like, I was working, like I said, I've been working a minimum of two jobs since I was an age of 16. I remember my mom, I asked my mom, privileged. I was like, I asked my mom, I was like, mommy, I want the new Louis Vuitton. And she looked at me and she was like, girl, if I don't have the newest Louis Vuitton, what makes you think you're going to get it? Challenge accepted. <laughs> I went, went out and got her a job to pay for it. I've been paying rent since I was like 15. And like, so I kept a bag. And so when I met Isabella, she was like, girl, why are you working so much? You got two full-time jobs. You work at a club and you go to school full-time. Why are you working so much? And I'm like, girl, because I like the things. I like the pretty things and everything. And she was like, well, I have a whorehouse called Trannylicious. <laughs> and she was like, you can't work for me. Cause you're too young. Cause I was 20 or 20 or coming into 21, I think. And she was like, but I can, you know, I'll show you some things. And so me being the condescending Capricorn and just, I'm a go getter. I was like, well, shit, bitch. I'm a go get what I want. And so I remember pulling up to speaking of Long Island, the motel out there called the plantation. No. <laughs> Again, I ain't realizing Island. things until much later in life. I'm so island. island. At the <laughs> and I pulled my first client. And this is back in 2000 and like, let's say 2002, 2003 ish. Mm -hmm. 
And I was like, girl, I'm about to pull a client. She's like, what, you about to do what? She's like, yeah, but I went to the hotel. He wants to do this, I'm gonna do that. And he, she was like, girl, what are you charging? I was like, I don't know what to tell him. She was like, tell him 250. I said, okay, okay. And she was like, what did she want you to do with him? She was like, I was like, I don't know, girl. I think he said he wrestled. I was like, she was like, you know what that mean, right? I'm like, no, like, I don't know. So I had this client and I was a mess. I got the coin though. <laughs> but this motherfucker throwing me around the room like a rag doll. And I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> Broke my nail and everything. She was like, okay, I see you won't do this one way or the other, I see. So let me go ahead and take you underneath my wing. <laughs> and I'm gonna show you how to do some things. <laughs> so she came, we first came up, she came with the name Denise Diamonds. And in her whorehouse, everyone had a name that was attached like a legendary porn star. So she was Isabella Del Rio from uh, Vanessa Del Rio. Then we had Raquel Chambers. I forgot what Raquel, the white woman's name was, the Chambers. And then we had Lovela Angelica Lovelace. And then I was Denise Diamonds. Again, don't know who the fuck that was, but you know, it came from something like that. And so back then, you know, it was all about the creating the illusion. So, you know, I had a profile, like I had a backstory. Denise Diamonds was, I think she said Egyptian and Brazilian. <laughs> That's what everybody has had <laughs> some kind of mix on there. That's so and you know, back then I had them blue contacts. I was addicted <laughs> to them blue contacts. You couldn't tell me shit. And so I had, I remember I had a client that was from, he was a military man. And he was like, oh, so you're, you know, Brazilian and, um, and, and Egyptian. <clears throat> and he was like, do you do you speak any you know do you do you speak any other languages? And I was like, Fogo. See, <laughs> started speaking to me in Arabic, and then I was like, what? And then he switched it to Portuguese. He's like, uh huh, okay, all right, whatever. I'm just gonna enjoy this session. <laughs> and so I told her about that. She was like, okay, girl, it might be time for a switch up then. <laughs> and so that's when we were high one day, smoking, and just like came up with Sasha Fox. Yeah, like that was the beginning. My my sex work career started around then. And like I didn't do many in-person clients. Mm -hmm. This was like the era where, like I said, Night Flirt had just started. And so we were the first girls on Night Flirt. There was only five of us. So wait, I wanted to explain to the people who are listening. Night Flirt is a, it's like a phone sex um, operation mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. people call you and it's like a phone sex operation. Yeah, it's a phone sex operation. Mm -hmm. think, think Girl 6. Also, you were able back then, eventually, you were able to kind of sell pictures. You were able to sell um, video cam sessions, like um, mm -hmm. you know, with your web and, and sessions, all kinds of stuff. But you, uh, essentially, it was a phone, girl six kind of yes. um, phone sex operation. And like bring it to the full circle, like not just a regular, like, because there are some people who worked in the office. Yeah. It was like how they was like, you want to make real Madonna and girl six was like, you want to make real money, you work from home. Yeah. That was, that was the thing. That was what it was. And so I was able to support myself off of just doing phone sex. Same. Early on, same. When I and first got on Night Flirt, it was like, oh, this coin is cute. Cute down. Making like a couple of thousand every few weeks, like every two weeks, something like that. Because we, we came out with bank. Yes. And then, you know, like everything else, Girls come along, and I will never knock a bitch for getting her money. But <laughs> not to the detriment of everyone else. So if you see the going rate is like $2.50 a minute, why is your site, why is your shit at 99 cents? So, you know, then stuff happened. 
And then I met another porn actor who was from Long Island. And he was like, you know, you're really pretty. And ain't no one like you. How do you feel about doing porn? And I was like, okay, all right, let's do some things. And he connected me with Tony V, a groovy. Mm -hmm. She felt young, black tea girls, Asian tea, all the, and, and I'm sure some of them are still around. Yeah. But let's give some history on that. So, Groovy is a porn production company. Yes. And it is, it specialized in, Brand I rock. would say, exploiting. <laughs> no, you ain't wrong. You came <laughs> <Yeah>. wrong. <laughs> It specialized in exploiting Black trans girls or this sector of, you know, it could be Asian trans girls or mm -hmm. just trans girls in particular. And they had um, individuals around the country in L.A., in Atlanta, in New York, who would take, who re would recruit, take pictures of the girls and take videos of the girls. They would, uh, they would basically... Um, be the logistic person for the um, creation of content. Mm -hmm. And they would pay the girls. Mm. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Very we can talk about that. Nothing. Very little while having a subscription website to, to access to all of these things, making tons of money and not actually paying the girls for their coins. When for you, their content. Yeah. When you did it, well, we, and we'll get back to that story. But when you did it, it was, you had to go all the way to Long Island to like West Bumblefuck, Long Island, out in Suffolk. Mm -hmm. You had to bring three looks. You did your own makeup. You did your own hair. You had to be able to get hard. They charged, they paid you basically based off of two things, how big your dick was and if you can come. If your dick wasn't big and you couldn't come, you getting about seven hundred for three looks. Five. <laughs> for three looks that included three looks that were photos and videos, and you were expected to come at the end of the session. Now Tony V was a pervert because a lot of my girlfriends did it, and it was like, "Girl, you got to let him know I'm not interested." Stop trying to touch me. Oh, you need help getting hard. <laughs> like, so this guy introduces me to Tony V. And Tony V is like, damn, I like the way you look. But ain't no one else going to want to see no fat black bitch. Yeah. Now, I'll buy a session from you. But none of my, none of the subscribers want to see this shit. And so I was like, oh, fuck. You just, A, you just reject me, but then you want to double down and be like, I like you, but no one else is going to like you. And so I was like, wow. So I went back to homie and told him, I was like, yo, you sent me to this fucking pervert. And then he disrespects me and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, let's take a different route. What is powerful about this moment in time for me as a trans woman, as a um, sex worker at the time, um, who is in a, what year was this in, in, in your story? This is at now, we're still at like 2004. Yep. So in this moment in my life, I was in a relationship. I was um, pausing sex work. I had been a sex work in like 2002, 2003, 2000, yeah, 2002, 2003, and in 2004, I had paused sex work because I caught myself being in love and wanting to be in this relationship and go get a regular, regular job and all this kind of stuff. So th th we know that didn't work out. <laughs> and so, but, <laughs> but in the moment I was, you know, I was pausing my sex work, but I was still in the chat room because this still was community. So I was in the BGC chat room. I was in the Black Planet chat rooms. I was in the Yahoo chat rooms. I was in the AOL chat room. And so me seeing other trans girls out here doing their thing and blah, 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 blah. It was such a powerful thing because, oh, it is, 
I, 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 my city had a community of trans women, but for me to see that this is not just here, this is in other places and like, oh my God. And I was from a small little city, Indianapolis. And I was like, oh, it, it's girls everywhere. I love this. Cause I've always been a community ass bitch. And so I was like, oh, I love this. And so one thing that I saw that, I, that really stood out to me was the black girls, the plus size black girls who were out here and I would see the kind of I, I wasn't plus size at the time, um, mm -hmm. but I would see the I would see the vitriol that was spewed at them. Mm -hmm. And coming from a family of women who were plus size and me being conscious, like just what, what it was safe to call us woke in, in the 90s and the early 2000s, because that was a part of the black culture. I right. was woke because I come from a, you know, people who were pan-African and people who was Muslim, people who was um people who just had a, a consciousness about them. And so because of that, I uh, I would see how the vitriol that they would throw at y'all, and I would see the hypocrisy of it. But I loved it was so inspiring for me to see y'all kind of out here doing your thing unapologetically, and y'all did it with so much confidence. And you know, I know that there were some things that were kind of hurting, and and you know, blah, blah 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 blah. But from my perspective, it was such a self confidence, and I really I, I talked about this in in my interview with T S Madison, but. Uh, it was you, T.S. Madison, and I know at the time she didn't consider herself plus size, but um, I did. And so uh, you, T.S. Madison, and Nikki, Juicy Nikki out in Florida, is it in Florida? Oh, yeah. uh -huh. Out in oh, Florida. Yeah. And just the big girls out here really Eve. making money. And Bring it way Eve. back. And T.S. Eve, like it was who is mm -hmm. T.S. Madison's mom. Mm -hmm. And so having these big women, these be unapologetically black and big women in the trans community and have these conversations that we would come to know in this era that we live in now as body body positive and and really expanding desirability politics in the conversations around fat bodies i was hearing y'all having these conversations in the early 2000s as queer, Black, trans women. And it was so powerful in radicalizing me. So I want to thank you for having that kind of confidence. And even though I know you was young and it may not have been intentional, that's what it was for me. And I think it's powerful. I appreciate that. You could it by the end, but baby, it was not easy. <laughs> baby, it was not easy. And I can honestly say it wasn't until I went to Sex Down South last year that I really got to a point where I was like, you know what? This is your body. You better love it. Because it's the only body you're going to get. Unless we're doing some ghost in the, in the shell shit. You know, this and that's powerful. And that's powerful. You just said last year. Last but year. you were already doing it just by existing 20 years ago. Well, 15 years ago. However long. That, well, I'm about 20. Yeah. Well, 20. Yes, about, yes, no, it's 20 years already. 20, 20 years ago, yes. So between, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 20 years ago, you for somebody watching you, you were already doing that. You were, to me, maybe not embodying it in yourself yet, but because you were just, I'm doing what I got to do, and I'm out here, Um, it looked like you were, it looked like you were confident, it looked like you were loving yourself, and it just was powerful. So it is, it, but it's also powerful that you said to yourself, it was last year. Yeah. Cause like when I think about it, it wasn't until two, right before COVID, I went to Puerto Rico with my friends and my family and I was bored. Like everyone had went to do something that I know I wasn't with like some like horseback riding. And I tried the equestrian life as a child. Like I had the old outfit and the pants and the, or <laughs> I love boots in the pants. It was sickening. And then I got on that horse. I put one foot in the stirrup. And I was like, that's up. That's all I needed. She reeled up. I said, I'm done. I'm done. Fuck this. Fuck <laughs> this. So they went to do that in Puerto Rico. And I said, well, I'm going to stay home. And so I was like, let me make some content. So I did. And they had this big, beautiful shower. And so I just made a video of me in the shower, washing my body and like playing with myself a little bit. And I posted it. And that was my best selling video of all times. Wow. And they said, finally, you're showing us the stomach. Finally, you're showing us the fupa. Because I'm so used to like covering it up. 
yeah, had to cover it up because like it's giving like, yes, we love big girls, but when people think of big girls or BBWs, we got people out here like Bow Wow and Drake are showing girls who are thick. That, I, that, that, um, that figure eight body, big titties, yes. big, big thighs, yes. but always, yeah. And that just ain't, that just wasn't me. And so they saw that and I was like, huh. So you've been telling me for over 15 years, I've been blocking my blessings and all I had to do is appreciate and show y'all the gut. Yeah. Because baby, when I tell you we have rehearsed ways to cover it up in certain positions, mm. how to do it on the side view, because back in my photos were always probably in doggy style. Or there was a side view where you lay down and you kind of like bring your thigh up to your titty. So you kind of cover up that little bit and then you turn your body a little bit. So yeah. I, my whole career, it was always finding positions that made you look less fat. Because everyone, when I, lived in, I lived in Miami for a year and a half. No money out there for me, none. And I had a guy stepping down, call my ad on arrows back before it was this extremely disgusting price they got now but called my ad and i told him my rate and he was like the fuck he was like for that i can get a colombian bitch with a real pussy and a banging body you too fat and too black to be charging those rates oh very um boston because <laughs> boston gave me that i could and i was just like Miami was the place that gave me one of the biggest complexes. Cause I was be fucking these guys that were body beautiful. Like I'm a, I'm a muscle queen. I love muscles. And like this one Cuban guy I was fucking with used to bring me dinner cause he worked in a restaurant and he was also an actor. Cause everyone's a fucking actor in Miami apparently. And he was like, you know, I really fuck with you. Like, I think I might love you. And I was like, oh, wow. Dick was good. Sex was banging, like, good looking. He was like, only thing is, he was like, I can't be seen with you. And I was like, what? He was like, it's not even because I was, and I'm thinking it's because of the trans. He was like, no, it's not even the trans part. He was like, you're fat. And that goes against the image of Miami and blah, 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 blah. But I love the body. I like, nigga was fucking me on my head. And I'm just like, well, you know, this is our last time, right? <laughs> well, I'm glad you had confidence to say that because some oh, of us wouldn't baby. even do that. If, 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 if nothing else, I have always exuded the ideology of confidence, even if I didn't believe it, because I was just like, baby, what you're not about to do is have me out here looking thirsty like the rest of these hoes. Uh-uh, no, ma'am. I will fucking, I'm with people, I will bite my nose and spite my face when it came down to that. You're not going to read me and then think I'm about to sit here and be like, well, okay. Oh, no, <laughs> no. no. Dick is too plentiful to ever chase a dick. And then me. it's a compounding thing, too. It's a compounding thing because you, when you come in, you just said, when you come into the porn industry, this fucking creep who, in your mind, like, you're a fucking creep. You're a fucking loser creep also adds to the, the is the first slice that says, you know, mm -hmm. ain't nobody gonna like your fat ass. And mm -hmm. then, you know, that's the first slice and then somebody else in Miami slice. And then you get what I'm saying? It's just uh, the constant, even like going to the corner store, going to the bodega and, and mm -hmm. you know, somebody saying something. It's the constant slice of saying that you're not enough or you're not enough. And then the juxtaposition of actually being in the game and motherfuckers is calling your ad and paying your 250, your 300 and flying you out for 10,000 and, and da, 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 da. Those days. Like, days. <laughs> girl, no shade, no shade. I remember living in Georgia and never being home because niggas was flying me out all left and right. Minimum five grand. Minimum. To travel, take you shopping, treat you like a guy. Like that's what's like I had in my lifetime, I've had three sugar dads, one that paid my titties. He <laughs> never got a chance to touch him before he died, but you know, <laughs> he, he paid for him. He paid for him. One another one was 
I don't know if you heard about this one in Smith Station, Alabama, there was a pastor who was also a mayor that can like trigger one and committed suicide mm. because they found out that he dressed up and it was in the news. That was my client. That was one of my sugar daddies. Mm -hmm. And then another guy who worked in the military, just like throwing money at me left and right. A guy from Paris sending me to go spend the weekend with him in Harlem. Throwing dollars. I wish I knew I had the financial literacy then. That I had now, bitch, I could have had multi houses. Yeah. Me and my mom would go shopping every fucking day. Buying designer shit because Money was being thrown. Less than the industry was good. We don't have sugar daddies anymore. We got splendor daddies, maybe equal, possibly. Equal. But we got that good old brown sugar daddies. <laughs> we ain't got that no more. No, hmm? no, we don't have that. Not you oh, know. It's just like, girl, like we also don't have a central location anymore. That you where. It used to be, you remember back in the day, it was three places that you could find the girls. It was Craigslist, Eros, and, you know, you had these kind of obscure ones like a City Vibe or a... Um, uh huh. Because I don't think Backpage existed back then. Yeah, that didn't come until they started fucking with Craigslist and um, mm -hmm. Eros. Um, so they, and, and I think that central location, people knew you can find the girls here. It wasn't really popular phone apps um mm -hmm. it really that really wasn't a thing and so the access to us was very very limited and because of that limited limitation when you when you come here you know you at least spending 200 250 and it start going down to 150 start you know what i'm saying it start being weird once the between stuff and tracks start to get in mm -hmm. and but it was it was your you are guaranteed to get you your two fifty your three hundred minimum minimum and you without minimum. any without any kind of um resistance like you this is what didn't blink at it didn't blink at it and the shade is you know where I met all my sugar daddies from for the most part YouTube really when I used to do all the little videos and skits with Isabella and we used to kiki and everything mm -hmm. like that. I had the one who bought my titties, Rhett Enzer. Mm. Fuck his wife, since she wanted to cut me out of my heritage. Fucking, <laughs> you know, fucking, he met me and I made a video once and I think it was like dating Sasha Fox or something like that. And I was like, I want a man I can roll off his dick and grab a burger. And so <laughs> he met me, he came up, he drove up from Florida to Columbus, Georgia. First thing he did, he was like, ma'am, I've enjoyed all of the things that you have provided. Here's a good burger for you. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Okay, work for listening. And then like, he was, I miss that man. I'm not gonna lie, he racist boots. Racist boots. Now, I don't know if he told the truth, but he was a Klan member, allegedly. Mm. Races down mistresses in about 40 different states. One of his mistresses was Jeffrey Dahmer's victim sister. Mm, like owed money, owed races good money. But he's the one who put me through finishing school. And like, you know, this is before I realized how problematic Emily Post was. But mm. like, put me through, he's supposed to like debut me at the Kentucky Derby mm. as a lady. Work. And like when he died, I think he died in a car accident or had a heart attack and had, had a car accident. He asked me once, he was like, what would it take to take you out the field and make you just mine? And I was like, I need at least four carat black diamond marquee cut surrounded <laughs> by white diamonds in a platinum setting. Allegedly, the wife called me when she let me know he died because I kept calling like, where the fuck is my money at? Like rent is due. And she told me, she was like, I found your ring. And we had a conversation. She knew who I was. She knew of all his, that's the one thing I will say, that old white man never lied about. Me. I was a trophy girlfriend. So he knew about all, she knew about all the girlfriends, but she only had a problem with me because I was trans. Mm. No other than the girls did she have a problem with. And so when, you know, when he died, 
She called asking me, well, what did y'all do? All this other stuff, blah, 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 blah. And then once she got her information, she had an attorney call me and was like, cease and desist. You can't, you know, we're, we're ending your termination on your the place you're living at, blah, 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 blah. So if y'all are lucky enough to get you a sugar or splendor daddy, make sure you get everything in your name. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> get in your name because I was uprooted. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the roadblocks that you came up against in regards to... um? like your life as a, a black trans sex worker? Like in industry and society at the time that you were working? I was, I had to create my own lane. And that's why I was the first BBW trans porn star because I had to create that lane. So being fat, <clears throat> being fat was one. This may, may not, this may not make sense, but when we think about men, it should. Too intelligent. They could not take it that I had a college degree, that I was not just about to be here on some dumb cunt shit and appreciate the little pennies that you wanted to throw at me. I always had a mouth. I had a word to say. I would never, a client came to see me, but we had the same birthday and he wanted to come see me on our birthday to spend it with me. And he brought a bottle of champagne. He was like, you know why this is called champagne? Because <laughs> it's from the Champagne region of France. <gasps> I can't believe you didn't know that. I can't believe you knew that. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, you thought I was thrown that kind. Oh, okay. No, baby. No, darling. We can have a whole we can we can have a whole conversation, politics, philosophy, whatever you want to go into, darling. You got the right one. Turned him off. I was too uppity, I guess you could say, for them. I had one client that only wanted to see me in bamboo earrings, a blonde wig, and red lipstick. <laughs> a bandy gun. Come bandy on. Gun. No, he was like, please, you know, turn off your man. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an alternative person. I've always been alternative. You know, turn off that nine inch nails of Marilyn Manson. Please put on some Biggie and 50 or whatever the fuck it was back in the day. I'm like, I don't even listen to that. But like, that was the fantasy he wanted. So those were the major ones that I could think of. Um, Yeah, being fat, being educated and not being like someone who was impoverished. Mm. Because it fucks with the fantasy. Yeah. Uh, so what were some of your like support systems? Like what kind of support network did you rely on? Um, like what was going on with your friends and your family or like even community organizations that you were like connected to? What were some of your um, support systems at the time? The girls. Mm, yes. The girls. I feel like, again, I feel. The girls nowadays are not like the girls back in the day. Though I may not have been a stroll girl, I was kind of raised by girls that were stroll girls. So I lived vicariously through them. All right. So let me explain this for the audience. So the difference that Victoria is talking about, the stroll girls are girls who are going to be on the whole straw, on the street, jumping in and out of cars, picking dates up, taking them from the car to a quick hour, hourly or half hourly hotel room and, and having them and then going back to the street, walking on the street. Da, da, da. That is a stroll girl. There also is a internet girl who is advertising, who is not going to a stroll. Usually they are in a hotel, usually a luxury hotel, not always a luxury hotel, but usually a high price girl is going to be in a high price hotel. Um, she's in a hotel and she's using the internet as the avenue to advertise. So she's going to be on different websites with her rate showing with, with nice pictures and all these with her number. And then they call you and you set up an appointment for you for them to come see you at a certain time. And then you have them in your hotel room and it, or you go to them if they have enough money for you to, to do uh, out call. So out call is when you go out to them in call is when you when they come into you. 
And so when she's what when she's talking about a stroll girl, she's talking about the girls who are on the street actually walking to get clients. That is a significantly more dangerous life. It's a significant to me, it's a significantly um the money that you get is significantly um different because you know, there's a difference between somebody pulling up on you and you on the corner and you say, I want three hundred dollars when you got a, a crackhead or a, a meth head over here charging uh fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. So when we think about Hunter's Point, is is that a that's yep. gonna be like a whole straw? Hunter's Point. Every Rose city, Avenue. Every city has one. Mm-hmm. And so you were more being raised by stroll girls as opposed to internet girls. Correct. And so the, 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 the stroll girls let me know that this is not the life you want. This is not it for you. Did we visit the stroll? Yes. But it was more like literally to visit. We went out there because the reality is that most of the strolls in New York, it's attached to like the nightlight district. Like Jackson Heights is the red light district in New York. And so Isabella lived in Elmhurst, which is close to Jackson Heights. And when I moved to New York, I lived in East Elmhurst, which is again, next to Jackson Heights. So even though I didn't work the stroll, because I went to the bars or the restaurants, I was always back and forth in that area. But those are the girls who raised me and was like, this is live, learn from what we went through to make your life easier. So I met. You don't think that camaraderie is happening nowadays? I haven't seen it. I think that it, I think it's, and if I do, I think it's different, right? I think that for me, when I got my implants and I got that 10 G's and I was going to go to Dr. Jacobs at the time, Dr. Jacobs was the femme queen doctor. He, all the girls, if you had a coin and you felt fab, you went to Dr. Jacobs. Dr. Jacobs had also had contracts with Playboy, Hustler. Like, he was that doctor. Yeah. He was like the Dr. Lee of, of, of now. Yes. And I remember being in the AOL, she male for she, no, not, not she male connections, but that was another good one. But mm -hmm. this was NYC she male room. And I was in there talking to the girls on there and I was they were like, girl, when are you gonna get your bags? When are you gonna get your bags? Implants. And I was like, girl, I'm about to make an appointment. Actually, I made an appointment with Dr. Jacobs. I'm going in to see him. And so my girlfriend, who ends up being my mentor, Cecilia Gentili, sent me a text message immediately. Was rest like, girl, in peace. rest in peace, Cecilia. She was like, cancel that appointment immediately. I was like, wait, what? She was like, he fucked me up. But call Alana, Alana Starr. So Shout I got out Alana internet. Starr, who also was one of the internet girls that was yep. banging at the time. And now she lives in Paris, but this is back when she still lived in New York. And Alana was also a very notorious madam. And so she called, she's like, no, girl, don't go to him. He's been killing the girls. And unfortunately, no one's talking about that. And unfortunately, they didn't talk about Dr. Jacobs and his fuck shit until, of course, he murdered two white women. That's when it came out that he was smoking crack and doing uh, doing coke while doing surgery and shit like that. And so I was always thankful to the girls because I knew Cecilia, but I didn't know Alana from a can of paint. I knew her because we've spoken in the chat rooms because it's always been like, you know, you see a girl, what's up, girl? What's your tea? Blah, blah, blah. And they always knew they was like, oh yeah, this is the, this is the college girl. Because I was in there like, you know, they knew everything that was going on because we talked. They gave advice. This was community. This was, this at was the community. community. And we didn't even have to know each other. subculture of a subculture. Yes. And we didn't even have to know each other in person, but we knew of each other and we took care of each other. So I always said that conversation probably saved my life. I don't see that nowadays. I see the girls being, knowing that still is bad for you. Being like, girl, let me take you to this doctor. Knowing that it's not Joanne, 
rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Knowing what was the other one that she trained, the only femme queen she trained, she only trained one person. Was so it Kelly, Kelly Harper? Kelly Harper. Yeah. Knowing it wasn't Kelly Harper. Rest in peace. Right. <laughs> Her sonny got her together. So like, you know what I mean? Like girls are like, oh no, let's go into this back alley and let me get you punk, sis. Like, I feel like that is what some of the things, like I see the girls that go at each other nowadays. And I'm just like, sis, at the end of the day, you may not like her, you may not love her, but if you getting your ass worn out in these streets, that bitch might be the only one that sticks in the fan for you. Either she gonna jump in or she gonna call the police and make sure you okay. I don't see that like I do now, like, like back in the day. Mm -hmm. I don't. And so like, maybe I'm so dis like dis detached from community. I think that now that Gen Z has come into the work, I think it's a little different. But I also feel like the, I feel like our transition was very different than the transition it is now. Just like before our transition, we the, every transition, every trans period has a period. Before us, I feel like we were the realness girls. It was everything was to be as real as possible. And when I say real, I mean to be as cis assumed as possible. Before that, it was the showgirl era. The Dorian Corey. Amanda Lepore, Dorian Corey, stuff like that. That was, it was the larger than life, Jessica Rabbit. Like, that was the girl's look. Nowadays, I feel like it is, I don't know what the look is now, because it's, it's so variant. And I do see that Gen Z, Gen Z is a lot more supportive in ways that we may not have had, but I feel like we had tough love. But also there's something missing. There's a community yes. bag that is a togetherness that, but I think it was just forced on us because we were a subculture of subculture. We were forced to be in community and help each other and, and, or we wouldn't have survived in a way that now there's an individualism that can actually, you can actually be, you can actually thrive without a community, not totally, but you can kind yeah, of yeah, right. even, even like you know we see people in, in going. I, I a girl recently she transitioned and moved to California for two years and got all of her once she became a resident got all of her surgeries paid for through Kaiser and her whole transition went in a, in went so and it was good it wasn't it, I, people love to call it like popcorn but no she did it she right. did it quick but it was also she just had good work and so. She went on to get to be just like her. To, now she's just living a regular, regular life. And while I think that's great, those access to things, we didn't have that growing oh. up. We had to work. We had to really scrape and suck dick and fuck and da, 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 do all of this shit to get the bare minimum of our needs taken care of. I and feel so like I, that. I think it's different now. It is very different now because I feel like when we were coming up, you had two tracks. Sex work or pageant queen? And the pageant queen was the girls, not just pageants, but the girls who worked the worked the jobs, the regular, like even like doing outreach and shit like that. But it was like But even that know. wasn't even it wasn't a plethora of jobs. Exactly. No, exactly. It and was the very pageant girls were usually stunt queens where they may not did sex work, but they uh be checking, writing checks. Right. All the scams, I mean, all the yeah. scams, maybe. Yeah. Yes. So it was like, it was one, it was one hustle or the other. And like, I chose the sex work route. And I feel like we had, we just, I, I feel like it was true sisterhood. I did a panel not too long ago and they asked about that. And I'm like, maybe I'm just an old bitty and disconnected from the younger people. But like I said, it's very individual. Like, I feel like the girls are like very cliquish. And so they don't have like we had. And like, I feel like even back in the day, it was beyond tough love. Cause the bitch was like, girl, you are hard as a brick, bitch. You a nail, don't talk to me in public. I'll meet you around the corner. I'll give you some moans, I'll help you, but don't you don't know me in public. <laughs> that, uh, what's her name, um, Consuela? 
Oh, a couple, yep, a couple, uh, oh my God. Oh, yes, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. The name is on a seven, couple, it's not, I don't know why Cover Girl keep coming to my head, yeah. but she had a document, Mirror Mirror or something like that, right? Yeah, Mirror Mirror, Consuela Cosmetic, or I don't something know. Something like that, something yeah. to tell. It was and that it, kind of tough love. And it was, and it was just that. Now, granted, she didn't want you talking in public, but if she saw something happening, she made sure you was okay. She'd either call 911 or checked in on you, like, girl, here's a fucking clean yourself up, girl. Like, what the fuck? Like, as much as I'm a, you know, a DEI kind of girl now, because it's still the world we live in, it wasn't always that. And the girls were, I, I, that's just like how I, that's my, how I've seen it. Like now girls, I feel like I'm very, like everyone has a, a channel and they're transitioning in the public eye and by themselves, or like I said, very small clicks. Yeah. So what about now? So you have transitioned to more things. What does your work look like now? Well, I am a, I'm still a sex worker because at the end of the day- I said some more things. <laughs> exactly. It gives because some girls have a secondary job at McDonald's. I have a secondary job, you know, on the phone, still on night flirt. <laughs> you know, doing uh, OnlyFans and stuff like that. Um, I'm 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 blessed to have I. It gets trigger warning. I had moved all over the place. I I'm originally from Long Island. Then I moved down south to Alabama to do my transition to start my transition. Why I moved to Alabama, I don't know. In my head, I was like, you know, no one knows me. Then I moved <laughs> to Georgia. From Georgia, I moved to Miami. Then I moved to New York, to Atlanta, back to New York. And in that time, like I said, I never really was an in-person girl. I was always digital, 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 digital. And money got slow. Money started to dry up. And I had a client who wanted to see me and do some things that I didn't advertise, I did. But when someone wants to bring back old school money, like, you know what? I'll give you 10 grand for a night. Say less. <laughs> but I was like, girl, that's rent for a few months. And then he sexually assaulted me. Mm. And at that moment, I was like, I'm good. And I had a client and for Mr. Crackhead, because all he would do was come over to my house and smoke crack. And we talk, play video games, talk, smoke crack. He smoke crack. And, you know, and I just kept him company. And he, I told him what had happened. And he was like, so what do you want to do about it? And I'm like, I don't want this life anymore. Because the guy, after he sexually assaulted me, he was like, well, where do you see yourself in a few years? And I'm sitting in a pool of my blood, like, what? And he was like, I don't know why you even asked that. You're going to be a dumb cocksucker like the rest of these hoes, dying on your knees. Mm. And that was like, this is my wake-up call. I need to get up out of this. Because I don't even usually see clients, but I gave in because money was slow and look what happened. So I went to work in a shelter and something happened with that and I was no longer able to work. Cecilia contacts me to find out what happened. And she was like, well, I'm looking at your records and you are a stellar employee. Do you want a job? And I've been at Trans Equity ever since for four years now. And she was my mentor. She helped me learn so much and unpack a lot of the trauma that we may not have seen as trauma at the time, we saw it as survival. And I started doing DEI work. And now I still, now I'm the director of contracts at her company still. And so I'm a consultant, walk around doing keynote speeches and giving talks and TV and documentaries and all that good stuff and celebrating the fact that I am what I call 
a hooker with a 401k. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> because, you know, Cecilia was very good to me. Very, very good to me. Like, I remember we were in a meeting once and my whole phone rang. And she was like, is that the hotline? I was like, yep. She's like, oh, pull your client. Call me when you're done. Mm -hmm. She didn't sit here and be like, girl, why is that on when you're on the clock and I'm paying you? No. She understood that sex work is work. And I'm not going to stop your back. And so she helped me and she started the coin clinic here in New York, which is the... Only like not only one, but like the, the first sex worker only clinic was St. James Infirmary in South in um San Francisco. Yeah. It closed down like two years ago at this point, I believe. Yeah. So then it was just us. And from the work that we did, now other ones are popping up, thankfully. Like um Woha is Washington State and by the Polynesian girls. Mm -hmm. came to a seminar that C uh, Cecilia and I did at Creating Change in San Francisco. And they were inspired by that work and they wanted to start their own clinic. Right. And so I'm out here now pushing the narrative that this is the world's oldest profession. Yeah. Why do we look at it as something to be a scandal or something to be ashamed of? Like, Bitch, before we had carpenters and doctors, we had bitches sucking dick. Like, is it really that much of a gagger? So I do now. I'm just trying to educate the world um, and help people understand that sex workers are people. And we have specific needs, just like any other employment. And that sex workers are more than just walking, talking STIs. Period. Because people think of sex work and automatically think prostitution. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm a living embodiment. Like, I yes, have I done quote unquote prostitution? Yes, I have. But most of my career is archived as digital. But people are looking at me like, oh, you're a sex worker? Here's some prep. <laughs> Here's some doxy pep. Yeah. Like, what does that matter if I'm jerking off on cam? How does that help me? Right. So just doing that work to help the world understand in the different intersections of oppression. So, you know, like, like everyone else nowadays, I'm in the DEI, DEI field, diversity, inclusion, and equity, what is it? diversion, equity, and inclusion. Mm, I love it. Give me, give me, give me euphoria, more than peace of mind. What is bringing you euphoria this week? Well, today I just um, found out that a piece I did for the Brooklyn Museum was reviewed. And so the New York Times wrote about it. So tomorrow's the opening of that wing in the Brooklyn Museum. So seeing that my work is being appreciated outside of our, com our direct community, brings me joy mm. because it's one of those things I'm just like I never thought I would be this person mm -hmm. like I think it may have dropped again but the life expectancy of a black trans woman is like 25 or 27 or something like that nowadays mm -hmm. and I'm 41 by the statistics I'm not supposed to be here but to know that I'm still here knowing when I did do social work and I was downstairs just doing at the welcome desk and someone was like, I know you, you're Sasha Fox, blah, blah, blah. You know, you helped me transition. Hearing your story helped me, blah, blah, blah. Now back then I wasn't ready to receive that because I was like fresh out of sex work. I'm like, you don't know me. Like literally running around, running away from people because I tried to separate myself from my past. And it was through my actual doing my social work job that I realized that, first of all, being a sex worker and social work are hand, go hand in hand. Really? Like, most of our favorite porn stars from back in the day are all therapists at this point. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, like, it go hand in hand. I didn't realize that, though. But now I realize that, like, 
I can have my cake and eat it too. I can help my community. I can help people who want to be allies or accomplices understand us and not be ashamed that I did this job. Right. Because we can't normalize sex work as a regular job unless we understand that. A doctor is not out there like, someone's like, oh, what do you do for a living? Dentist. <laughs> oh, gee, why? No, they say it with their whole fucking chest out. So I had learned to have to sit there and normalize it. Because if I can't say it with my, my chest out, then how can I expect other people to appreciate the erotic arts or being a pleasure provider? Yeah. So having that be recognized in the Brooklyn Museum was amazing. And even last week, I got an award for the work I've been doing. So that is what's been bringing me joy, having the world see me as an individual and that knowing that Victoria Von Black is as big, if not bigger, than Siren DeVille or Sasha Fox. People actually see me and not just a persona. That is, but that has brought me a lot of joy. I really appreciate that. What has been bringing me joy this week is um, in two days, it is October the 3rd, October the 5th, will be this show's seven year anniversary. Congratulations. Yes. And I am so excited about um, just, just where the journey has come to. I appreciate what I have learned through the whole seven years and um, the archive that we have built in discussing Black trans issues and bringing Black trans leaders and Black trans personalities and just people like you on the platform and talking about it. And um, even when we were not being supported in, regard, in regards to like financially and, mm -hmm. um, and how it has grown to, you know, I'm out here doing what I love to do. I appreciate it so much. And um, that is what has brought me joy this week, just knowing that, oh my God, it's our seven year anniversary and I appreciate it. Oh, that is amazing. I, <laughs> I always wanted you to come on the show. I appreciate you and I appreciate what you represent in my life and what you represent in our community. And, you know, keep doing what you're doing. And thank you for spending time with me. Thank you for having me. I definitely would love to do this again. Like, this was beautiful. And I'm like, I'm just, um, anytime I've ever seen you, I'm like, I remember that. I remember that girl. Yes. Seeing you on YouTube and everything, I was just like, work, bitch. I appreciate you. <laughs> well, thank you All for right. having me. All right, y'all, make sure y'all um, share this episode. Make sure you um, thumbs up and give us a review and we will see y'all next week. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye now. I make it easy to love me. I make it easy to care for me. I make it easy to share all your world with me.